Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of React Roundup. I'm your host today, Dave Sedia, and we're joined by our panelists, Leslie Coneline. Hey, y'all. Thomas Alot. Hello, Internet people. Lucas Hayes. Hi, everybody. And today we've got a special guest. We have Sean Wang. Probably you better know him as Swix on the Internet. He is the moderator of the React.js subreddit and works at Netlify and is kind of just everywhere online. So say hello, Sean. Hey, everyone. <laughs> awesome intro. And I feel like I've met each of you like it vaguely online on and off. Dave, I feel like the last time we met was in Vegas. Yeah, I think we, we also maybe React Boston, too. I, I don't remember which oh, one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like I've never done this before. I never don't know what the format's going to be, but it's almost like just chatting with, uh, with friends. <laughs> that's it. That's the format. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's the gimmick. <laughs> Hey folks, I just want to let you know quickly about Netlify. Netlify is a really cool system for hosting what are traditionally known as static sites. However, the real benefit that I've been finding is that I don't have to mess with a back end. I can just set things up. I build the website out. I've been using a system called 11 djs and you just deploy it. And then anything that you have that you want to do, you can do on the front end. So if you want to pull in some kind of database with Firebase or something else, if you want to collect form data, Netlify provides all kinds of services that make it easy to do all that stuff. If you're trying to do serverless, they have a really, really neat serverless setup that will allow you to deploy your websites without having to deploy a backend and it'll do some of the work for you. I, I just I just love it. So if you're looking for a way that you can actually deploy a website that only has front end technology in it, gives you all the tools that you typically need for the back end without having to actually program the back end, then give them a try. Go check them out at netlify.com. What's your background? For people who don't know you, how did you learn? Like, how did you become a dev? And Oh, right. Uh, okay. So I've done various iterations of this. And the last time I did this, it lasted two hours uh, with <laughs> Quincy Larson on the Free Code Camp podcast. So if you want the full story, go there. But essentially, I, I'm a career changer. I think there's more and more of us uh, in web development, basically to fill the, the, the demand and also uh, people realizing, like me, uh, realizing that it's, uh, it's a really good industry to work in. I started in finance, actually. So huh. I was born and raised in Singapore, came over for college, 10 years ago, um, and then graduated and, and went straight to finance. Did a number of roles, in, including, I think, central banking, investment banking, and then had, uh, finally ended up in a hedge fund. And I think something that a lot of people don't, under, don't realize about finance careers is that nearly every finance junior is now kind of a software engineer. You start out uh, messing around with spreadsheets because you have to like, manipulate numbers. But then because software is eating the world to get good, you start to have to learn VBA to automate the Excel sheets. Mm, and then yeah. That's exactly what happened to me. I, I started having to do matrix multiplications of my data and then like doing all sorts of um, spreadsheet automation to the point where I actually had my own library going on, even though I didn't, I didn't know to call it that. I didn't have a GitHub. I just had this VBA file. It was one file and I just like, you know, copy pasted it everywhere I went. Um, <laughs> One thing I really enjoyed about VBA was actually, I, I like to tell people this, even this is before I was a dev, but I was just like, Microsoft Excel and, and VBA is the one programming language and IDE and environment that, that you can count on to be installed at any work computer. This is when, before everyone had Macs, right? But you know, think back to a world where everyone had Windows and Microsoft, Microsoft Excel. That's the one programming environment everyone has. And once I can paste my little library thing in, I can do a ton of automation with that. So, so I, had, I had that with me. But then also, at some point in time, you start to test the limits of Excel and you start to have your spreadsheets freeze up because <laughs> too much memory going on, right? React people would hate Excel because basically every time <laughs> you update a cell, um, every, th- every other cell updates. So there's no, there's like, it's global context. Like, <laughs> you know, there, there's no should component, should <laughs> cell update. No, no, no. Everything, should, everything should update at all times. Uh, but that, I mean, that's the, that's the joy of reactivity. And I think there is a simpler uh, programming model based on that. So you graduate from Excel and you're like, all right, what, what else do I do use for number crunching? And that's, um, that's, the, uh, that's data science, that's uh, Python. So I started learning Python and doing a lot of number crunching you know, off the spreadsheet and, in, and just, in, just in raw memory. And then, I, and then I moved to a bank for a couple of years where I was doing... Um, Currency derivatives trading, so like vanilla and structured options on foreign exchange, and that was in London. And that at that bank, uh, they didn't allow Python. They they forced me to learn Haskell. So 
Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, it, it's just randomly uh, the entire IT department at that company was taken over by, by Haskell devs. So uh, like one of the, they hired one of them and then they hired all their friends. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the, guy, <laughs> the guy who made Hugo, uh, Neil Mitchell, is one of my close personal friends now because... Made what? Hugo, Hugo's the search engine for Haskell. Oh, awesome. Where wow. you, can search, you can search any Haskell package by their type signature. Oh, cool. Um, so because it's a strongly typed language, right? And in pure functional. Mm, nice. We need that in TypeScript. With like strong monads and stuff. Uh, actually, someone has made it for TypeScript. Oh, sweet. Uh, it just, you know, uh, takes some effort and community buy-in. I think that a lot of these things, like things don't just happen just because like someone's made it. Like it, it does take a lot of effort marketing. And, yes. Uh, I guess, I guess you got to build it right. and then you got to people have to know about it. That's why I have a job. <laughs> Then I moved to uh, my hedge fund job where I use uh, where I use Python again. But then I, I actually burned out of, of my of my uh, finance career because it was it was very high stress. And then I realized that like I was I wasn't I was like kind of average at the finance bit, like buying and selling buy low sell high stuff. <laughs> That's the kind of the joke, like you know, just don't forget buy low sell high. And it's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. loving this story. But anyway, so so that's one thing. I was I was burning out of finance, but then I was also also realizing that um, I was the bottleneck. Like I, every time someone wanted to run analysis, I had to be there in front of the, the computer, pressing the button, running this the the program, filling the knobs. Right. Um, mm. I realized if I if I just build user interfaces, people could do it for themselves. So I so I started to move more and more towards uh, front end and like developing products that could stand alone. And I think, you know, and that's, that's, what, that's what eventually drew me to, to, to JavaScript. I, I took a product manager job in between just to figure out if I really wanted to do this. And then after, after becoming sure about that, I just quit and spent a whole year, uh, first six months doing free code camp and then three months doing boot camp. And that was all 2017. And then 2018, I started my first uh, dev job. Wow. Um, that job was doing a design system in a hedge fund here in New York. It was an okay like job. By fire. Here, do a design system. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I think they were fine because, like, basically, it's it's a hedge funds are uh, again like this is this is how finance people think about tech. Like, they all want to play startup now, um, so they they just had a lot of money and they threw it at us. I mean, coming, out of, coming coming out of coming out of a boot camp, the average salary is like let's say ninety k. I got paid two hundred and fifteen k. Um, <laughs> for, for that's the total comp, and I, it was definitely overpaid. And it was it was like definitely like they were just throwing money to like not have any discussion about hiring, and they they just wanted to build out a team, and they they built they built it out really fast. But I wasn't doing anything. So then I so then I started being active on Twitter, started being active on Reddit, started doing meetups and stuff, and uh, and open source, and that's eventually how I got noticed by Nellify, and 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 then I joined in August right after React Rally. React Rally was my first conference talk and uh and i think that's the rest is history kind of wow quick <laughs> it wasn't that long ago <laughs> not too long ago how in the javascript community you can be talking to you know somebody that's like an old gray beard standing next to somebody that's you know just out of a boot camp for three weeks and it's like we're all kind of equals because things change so much <laughs> Yeah. That everybody's background no matter what random thing that we did in our past lives from six months ago, the the things that we learned are applicable because everything's changing so much. You know, whatever you learned in finance, whatever I learned in design and, you know, working at a call center and <laughs> <laughs> those concepts yeah. are coming back. They're applicable again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, I'm not an equal in the sense that I don't know a lot of history. I don't, I don't know a lot of, like, I, I try to make up for it by, by intense study. Mm. <laughs> Twitter is actually really good for this. If you, if you do the search and then you just keep going back. Oh yeah. Uh, so um, don't look at all my old tweets, though. It's embarrassing. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and you know, <laughs> and I have a you know I have a useless CFA degree that a CFA certification that I might use someday. What's that? A CFA, a Chartered Financial Analyst. That's the huh. professional oh. qualification you get in finance. But like you know, my roommate now he's a banker and he's he's studying for that. And I'm like, ah, oh, I'm so over that right now. But I don't know. I think you take uh, wandering wandering paths in life, and I think. You know, you try to make the most of what you what you can at at the at the point in time. But I, I'm definitely enjoying this career more than the previous one. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's really this cool is... that you, you sort of came through this on roads of automating the job that you were you were already doing. Yes, 
They're like, instead of just learning to code because I want a coding career or something like that, like you had, you had a, a, something to fix and you were like, I'm going to learn to code to solve this problem. Right, and then yes. you kind of built on that. I definitely also noticed like I just enjoyed it. Like that was the most enjoyable part of the job. That's what, that's what I was good at. And I wasn't good at the other part. So why not do that as a, as a, as a <laughs> Yeah, it's so fun yeah. to save yourself work, right? Like that's... <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, there's actually a lot of us finance people who want to cross over to tech. Like I get pings every now and then from finance people who like hear my story and they want to do it. And I mean, these are smart people. They, they just have been working. You've never heard of them, but they, they just like are cooped up in a bank doing random bank shit. Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> yeah, it's really impressive. Uh, I was, I already also have this like Excel background. I worked with finance, but in consulting. Yeah. And there were some pretty amazing people working on Excel. Like I remember there was some people doing some fancy stuff with their Excel spreadsheets and they are, they're not programmers. So this is, it's really interesting. The, the, the way I became a programmer was I was the one starting to talk to the programmers when we needed something heavier than, than, than Excel. Like as soon as Excel was crashing our consulting <laughs> gigs, people were like, oh my God, we need to talk to those people, the devs. <laughs> it's like the devs are these people that are like kind of cranky and they were like, <laughs> okay. And then I was like, let, yeah, I was like, okay, so let, let me try to do this. Okay, SQL, let me Google it. <laughs> this right. kind of thing. And then little by little, I became the one that talks to the, to, to the devs. This is the guy who talks to the devs, talk to him. And at some point I was working with the devs 100% of the time. Yeah. So it's interesting. And I remember from my Excel days, I have some, some friends that are like Excel wizards that sometimes I think they would be like so like amazing devs. They were doing like system architecture because like what they're doing there is it's really good. Yeah. yeah. Excel also got me interested in, in programming early on. Like I started as a designer and I was aggressively disinterested in programming. <laughs> but when I started, you know, the, the bubble burst, the economy collapsed. I was working at like a, like just doing temp jobs. And like, that's all I had was a VB script, Excel. And like, I went to town and it got me really excited about yeah. that world again. Yeah, I, I mean, I messed around with Visual Basic and Dreamweaver and all that uh, in the in the early days, but I just never got anywhere. I think the the way that I, the reason I counted myself out of programming was I saw my friends who were doing like PHP and they had like awesome command line wizardry and stuff, and I thought that wasn't for me because I didn't know any of the commands. Yeah, um, and that was <laughs> that was done for twenty years, right? I just like peace out of of programming for twenty years. Yeah. I, I feel like I if it was a little bit more accessible back then. I uh, probably would have stuck with it. <laughs> that kind of dovetails nicely with your whole uh, kind of learn in public manifesto that you pinned on Twitter. That like that had a huge effect on me. Can you like summarize what that's all all about? Yeah. Oh, well, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm really flattered that that it you know affected you in that way. Um, it was actually kind of like a little graduation speech that I was preparing for my bootcamp people. But basically, the the the, the whole idea is that there's sort of two choices in in learning. The default is learning in private, where you whatever you learn, you sort of keep with you, and you don't you um, try to use it in your work, and, and that's fine. But the alternative is learning in public, where you actually share what you learn, and that has uh, and and the the whole thesis behind this is that that has a disproportionate impact, like on your career success, on your personal development, on your networking, and so I, I think there's there's a few dimensions to that. Um, I actually uh, just did a talk about this at VU in New York yesterday. That's um, <laughs> Uh, and this and learning public kind of like revolves around uh, a few different mod- modalities like writing, speaking, coding, uh, and coding can involve like triaging issues or making libraries or or stuff like that. But the the whole idea is that you should try to do it in public where people can access your work, you can access your own work. So avoid things like Slack or Discord where it's like a closed garden and IRC. And- uh, right. Um, and, and embrace embrace things that are open like Reddit or Twitter. Right. And that's that's exactly what I did for 2018. And I also, I also count in-memory storage as <laughs> like, you know, that, that's what we do a lot of times. That's the default. We're just told to like, you know, whatever you learn, just like keep it in, in memory and uh, hope that you, you like retain it. So the, the reason it works is basically there, there are a few... Uh, categories to this. Uh, people notice genuine learners and they want to help you, especially if you're doing the, the thing that they work on. So my example for this would be uh, one, of the, one of the earliest uh, ways I got noticed 
by Danny Abramov was on March 1st of last year, they did the React Suspense talk at JSConf Iceland, right? Everyone, everyone remembers that talk. I watched it. I stayed up overnight to go through all the code. And then I wrote up a blog post and published it on March 2nd, walking through the entire code. And obviously, Dan saw it, read it, uh, shared it. That's uh, huge. Gave me feedback on it. Like, I want to link to that. <laughs> like, there's no way in which, like, yeah, how do you, how do you, how do you, you, you can't pay for that. So, like, people notice and they want to help you. But then also, there's, there's uh, just like the human psychology. This is called Cunningham's Law. Like, if you're wrong about stuff, people will come out of the woodwork to correct you. Oh, uh, that's brilliant. There's, there's a famous X, XKCD about, like, you know, like this, this guy, like, his wife is calling him to come to bed and he's like, I can't. And the, the wife says, why? And, she, and the guy goes, I, I can't. Someone's wrong on the internet, and he's like frantically typing. <laughs> <laughs> and then just people, people want people love to to correct you. Uh, and the reason I know this is called Cunningham's Law is because I was on a podcast and I called it Godwin's Law. And guess what? Someone came and corrected me. <laughs> so, <laughs> that is, it's like nerd sniping. So, so I won't. You know, I, I won't forget. Nerd it's, sniping. It's, it's embarrassing, <laughs> right? It's embarrassing, but only like it's fine being embarrassing as as long as like you know you you just try your best every time and you keep your ego small. I like to say that you can learn so much on the internet for this low, low price of your ego. Dude. And that's really it. You divorce your identity from your work and you, you do the best work you can. But once it's, once it's out, you always know that you can improve. And that helps with shipping as well. Because if you always try to make it perfect, then you'll never ship. Yeah, that, that literally is like, was seriously the biggest problem in my entire life. Like back in the Mutuals days, 2007-ish, it's like all my learning happened on IRC. Like I had my own blog, you know, barely. but like my, my biggest motivation in life was to prove that I'm not an idiot <laughs> and get validation from the smartest people I could find that I was one of them. Right. So the thought of learning in public, of admitting that, I all, that I'm not perfect, admitting that I don't already know everything there is to know about everything was the most unimaginable thought in my life. Yeah. I kind of accidentally stumbled into learning in public in a few different ways just because I can't stop myself from talking. But like your post came at like the perfect time as I was kind of going through some self growth stuff. And it kind of helped me crystallize something major about like my own sense of identity. Like I I was kind of forcing other people to be responsible for my identity to validate me instead of going and doing the hard work to grow my own self to learn, to be authentic to admit that I don't already know things so that I could grow more out in public and not just on IRC. Yeah. I think one, one strategy to, to help with that is just lampshading. That's what I call, it's a plot device in, in writing, TV writing. I, I enjoy like, you know, analyzing plot devices and stuff. Lampshading is just like taking your biggest flaw and just saying like, just like hanging a lamp on it and just pointing at it and going like, hey everyone, like I know this is a thing. Like um, Eminem. Once you've acknowledged it, um, no one else can come along and like it's 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 then derivative to, to just come along and repeat what you just said. That's epic. Like <laughs> Eminem does that. Like in his rap battles, he like he he disses Eight himself mile. so hard, so yeah. epically, and leaves nothing left for the opposition to yeah. attack him with. It's like I already said that. Yeah, and you said it worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I mean, I I like that. I I you know, it's it's also called I also call it like sort of. Uh, wearing your vulnerability, uh, wearing your weakness on your sleeve, and 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 having that as a as a weapon. I, I almost one of my advice for for people starting their first jobs, like for example, when when I first started, you know, I, I was asked if I knew TypeScript, and uh, I didn't I didn't know TypeScript at, at that point. And I think a lot of people might be sort of incentivized to just say like I kind of know it, and then they they sort of go home and study up and and try to <laughs> you know because they they want to prove their value in in their first dev job. Yeah. But I think if you sort of reframe that, that perspective, like they already hired you knowing, knowing your background, you should just like lay it all out. Like just be, I kind of call it like the opposite of knowledge is power. Like ignorance is power. Like your, like, ignorance, your ignorance is fine because they can accept it and, they, can, and they, they, they know that you'll fess up if you don't know something. So they, it builds trust and it actually shows people um, where you can be mentored and, and taught and, and you can work with them. Because people desperately need to help others, like that need to connect and that need to help. It brings out the best in some people. Yeah. Uh, and if I'm not honest with other people, if we're not honest with other people of where we need help, nobody can come in to help us. It feels like an attack at that point. It sort of takes away the power from that idea of imposter syndrome also, right? Like yeah. you're the one saying, I don't know this. 
Yeah. That imposter syndrome has no power over you, right? You're kind of reclaiming that to say, like, I'm just going to be honest about what I don't know. Yeah. So lampshading, you know, I think that there's many terms for this. I do want to, I do want to mention that I think not everyone can do this. Um, not everyone should do this. And there's some people who don't feel secure. They, they might feel uh, threatened if they admit to vulnerabilities. And where it's appropriate, uh, they should be guarded because uh, they have to look out for themselves first. So I think there's certain levels at which it, 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 it really depends on reading the situation and reading the person that you're dealing with. And, and that's, that's a lot of it as well. I, I don't preach this as a one-size-fits-all thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think that it's, it's been extremely beneficial to me. And I think everyone can interpret it for their own purposes and, and, and apply their own skills, techniques, preferences um, to how they learn in public. But I'm just saying, like, there's so many reasons to go. Like, I'm only halfway through my list. There's other, <laughs> um, I'll, just, I'll just quickly list off the, the others because we don't have time. But human psychology, like a commitment mechanism, because you're in public, people expect stuff from you and people give you positive feedback and positive reinforcement. That's the stuff that you don't get in uh, learning in private. There's another aspect of human psychology, which is availability bias. This is, this is really rampant because the problem with learning public being so powerful is that people th- start thinking that you know more than you actually do. So I, I get this a lot. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me put it this way. Like, Oh God, I, I don't want to like offend people. Okay, I'll just I'll just like <laughs> I'll just be generic. So basically, like you know, the the most available, the first name that comes to mind, people think is the best, and they confuse that with the best. That's just a, a heuristic. That's a that's a bias that that we all have, and you can exploit that by just being more available than other people. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's really ironic, but that's that's a little bit of the carpet bombing content strategy that some people do. But then also just being like so out there on like this one particular topic. I think Ken C. Dawes does this really well on testing. Like now he's the yes. testing guy. Well, like, I think is, testing, is, I think Ken C. Dodds. <laughs> is he the best tester person in the world? I don't know, but he's the first, he's the most available guy. He owns testingjavascript.com. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a, it's, it's a marketing bias. Like it's, 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 a, it's one of those, like we just don't have that much capacity in our heads to, to actually really? do, do a global sure, option. Okay. Yeah. There's a, one interesting thing. I, I started doing that at some point in my life. So because yeah. I was changing my career so many times, I was always like new to, to a field. The more I tried to be transparent about it, I think the more benefits I got. That, that's interesting. So uh, I, I agree with you. But one really interesting thing about learning in public is that when you know some, something a lot, people reach out to you for answers. They have problems and they reach you oh, out yeah. for answers. Like you are... You are the person who knows the answers. So there's a there's some domains that I know a lot of answers. Like we've we've all been working with React for years. So there's we we know a bunch of answers like in with React code. We can say that. But the interesting thing when you learn in public, be either like in super public like you do, or like inside your company and stuff like that, is that people start reaching out to learn things together with you to think about problems like they reach out not because you know answers but because you will think about the problem together with it i I was noticing that the more i learned in public people are reaching out to think about problems with me which is a much more interesting thing to do than only be like the answer compendium you know because these answers will these answers will vanish in time like i don't know how front-end programming will be in two years I don't know if I'll be in front end in two years. Uh, you know, like life is life is going to change. It, it's crazy. But people reaching out to you to think about problems, I think is the most interesting uh, result of learning in front of other people and showing this, yeah, yeah. Showing this aspect of us. So I actually take this as, um, and this is from another part of my life, which is like I, I, I had a business degree. And this, this is more of the concept of inbound versus outbound marketing. When you're learning in public, you're, you're basically announcing to the world the stuff that you're interested in. And people come connect to you on your terms and engage with you on exactly the stuff that you want to learn. Whereas outbound is more like uh, you're reaching out and then um, hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll sort of answer your message or something. Um, and they, they don't know who you are. So I think that's uh, having inbound opportunities and knowledge. Like, like I got like, you know, my, my current job from a Twitter DM. I'm sure many people on, on mm-hmm. tech actually actually get that. This is all inbound. Like this, you, you don't you don't have this kind of job posting uh, available. Otherwise, 
the last piece I also wanted to to mention, uh, and, and I've sort of capped off my rant. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is taking too long. Uh, is that it builds capital, which is existing existing and portable capital to repurpose. Um, so portable in the sense that it stays with you after your current job. Uh, Patrick McKenzie, Patio Eleven on on Hacker News has this saying where he says, "Don't end the week with nothing." Like wh- whatever you work on, that at the end of the day, like you sh- you're paid on to to work for your company, but then also if you leave with nothing to your name as well, then uh, it doesn't really benefit you for, for your next thing. Uh, you know, God forbid you ever leave. But uh, I'm just saying like having that portability, just like open source is portable, it's really nice, you know, for building career capital. And I also use the word capital consciously in the sense that it, it makes you friends with while you sleep. So like the stuff that I do, the talks that I've done, the, 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 the stuff that I've written is available to anyone asynchronously and that scales me. And and I think that's that's extremely, that's extremely powerful. Yeah, it's not some money. Um, I mean, it's it started to convert to money, but yeah, it doesn't have to be money, right? It can be opportunities. It can be friends. I think that's extremely valuable as well. Like the I I really value the the reason I'm on Twitter is like I really value the ability to connect with people like you, and like and and now like yeah. I kind of view it as like a second brain. Like you know how you know how your brain like only has like it 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 scales as a function of the number of neurons that connect with each other. Why not connect with more neurons that just happen to be outside your your current brain? High level networking effects. <laughs> um, and and so I was like, yeah, I was thinking about that when you when you were talking about like you know working with other people who who come work with you. But yeah, that's the rough like why does it work? That's yeah. the whole long list. So now one of the things that you mentioned is like the balance between of of sharing too little versus oversharing. It was Jordan Walk actually who taught me the concept of option value of like, I've always been a, a, I'll figure it out later, not thinking in the moment over sharer. And Jordan kind of pulled me aside and like, here's this concept of option value. Once you say something, it's too late to not say it. And that's why I was no longer on the React Native team because I couldn't just shut up and let the project grow. I was too excited about it. <laughs> um, so I, I moved on to a different team against my will. But like learning from guys like Jordan and Tomachino like, taught me these concepts of how to be more serious about the career and how to be more serious about kind of the, the connections and the dynamics of, of, with humans. Mm-hmm. And the whole learning in, in public thing is is so good because it kind of gives you that good balance of like, it is not about you and your entire life. This is just about this aspect of you, where you're trying to go. You're trying to play with everybody, learn with everybody and bring everybody with you. It, it's a nice balance. Yeah. I, I do want to make the point that it's not altruistic. This genuinely is the fastest way for you to learn. And it's, it's, it's self-interest that should, that should motivate people because I think that pure altruism is, is a nice factor is a, it's a nice to have but it doesn't motivate people for long like it, you, don't st- you don't stick with it for the long run if if, if you are not personally getting something out of it so it, it genuinely is the fastest way to learn because you 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 know being wrong in public and positive reinforcement loops and all that so yeah that's all that's all really powerful yeah, yeah. I, I like that you also bring up that this isn't necessarily safe for everyone in tech right but oh yeah kind yeah. of levels i would say that as a woman right um on Reddit in particular, I feel much more comfortable under a fake anonymous <laughs> name. I was no actually one knows you're a dog. <laughs> no one knows. Don't, don't talk to me. <laughs> yeah, I just that when I met Swix and, and knew that, oh, wait, he's actually using his name on his, his Reddit account, I was actually kind of shocked because I had never really encountered that so openly, especially on Reddit where most people are anonymous. But I appreciate that there's sort of ways to, to dip your toes into learning in public, right? Um, there are areas that I feel confident to be that person who can talk about something like accessibility. And there are other areas where even if I have strong opinions, maybe I'm going to say that on Reddit under my, you know, anonymous username and feel Ooh. comfortable and safe in that place. People can still call me out, but my name isn't attached to it. And that's dipping my toes in, right? And hopefully one day I can push myself past that in certain scenarios. But for right now, that's kind of where I feel safe. And so for me, that's okay, right? And, and yeah. that's important. Yeah, it's, this is absolutely not a call to be a complete open book. Notice I didn't say live in public or like show your family photos or yeah. uh, like talk about your personal finances, even though I do. But it's a personal choice. And But I'm just saying just the, just the learning piece and specific sections of the learning piece. And you can pick and choose how you do it. I actually have some really good examples of people who, who do really well at that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up my keynote presentation from yesterday. So I can actually talk about it. Like, but like, so, but like certain people come to mind as like 
like who are more polished. And if if like being so raw is is not suitable for you, uh, for whatever reason, like personal or just like whatever your preference is, like you can actually just learn, just share more polished products. I think who who's who's really good. At? Julia Evans does does her bash shell cartoons. Uh, it's it's really simple stuff, and, and I'm sure she knows way more than than she lets on. But like that's that's a form of learning in public as well. Like I, she was really interested in in bash commands, and she started like writing these up and. Surprise, surprise! It actually has a lot of value for other people. Um, I also want to want to shout out to Lynn Clark. Lynn Clark also does code cartoons, and that what what is that if not like a, a weaponized form of learning in public? <laughs> I mean, who else explains you know WebAssembly and React Fiber with cartoons? Um, it's it's, oh, man, it's I, I it's, really need to read up all the stuff. Oh, uh, Lynn Clark! I think she did the the past few talks at JSConf and React Europe about these various uh, pretty advanced topics. But like you know, those are super accomplished people, but like maybe a little bit closer to home. I think one of the up and comers are, is like people like Samantha Ming. She does these like little JS snippets online, which are like kind of stylized, but then they present something that you might, might not know about, you know, JS fundamentals. And these are all like more polished products. You don't see the raw form and people don't get to attack you on, the, on, on just the rawness. And that's fine. Uh, and, but she's like, she's growing her own profile that way and, and getting people engaging and teaching her stuff as well. On that level, I think I think that's that's perfectly fine, and, and there are many ways to do it, and there are many role models in whatever discipline, uh, whatever group you identify yourself with. I had someone ask me yesterday, like she was, she, you know, she's underrepresented minority, and she was like, you know, what's what about people like me? Like I, I don't feel safe doing that. And then I just like pointed out like three different people <laughs> that were in her group, and I was like, look at these. Like it's not like there's every every group has positive role models, and it's it's really up to you to to like send a make of that what what you can and what you will and I, it's you know it's definitely not up to me because i don't live that life uh, i don't i don't i don't know your your own personal situation but yeah i mean that's uh, this this really gets like deep and philosophical and personal but i just want to say like there there's many people in many many different forms of learning public <laughs> It seems like there's more, more available spaces now like I, I felt comfortable being myself on irc back in the day but i didn't feel comfortable being myself any well there wasn't anywhere else <laughs> the public part does not need to be like the whole world for everybody like you can start no. with like a group of a closed group of friends and then maybe start at your team when where you work your company like you don't need to be you don't need to throw yourself into the world so raw and to, like for everybody right maybe you can start smaller yeah. with a smaller group yeah, even um, Facebook is pivoting towards groups now. <laughs> yes, indeed. It's a uh, surprisingly you don't have to be you don't have to monitor people as much if you're not a global publishing platform. Um, <laughs> I do have a concept of learning gears. A lot of people ask me how to start learning, and I think uh, I I kind of split it up into three gears: uh, explorer, connector, and miner. And that's that was like the subsequent that was the follow up essay. Basically, the the long story short is that if you're less comfortable being raw, then don't do the exploring in public. Just explore in private, and then only once you only once you feel like you're you're relatively comfortable with with stuff, um, then connect people with with knowledge and connect topics. That's a good point. That's a mode. Uh, and then the minor gear is for when you really hit gold, um, when you're you're mining for gold, and and that's when you're obsessed by something that's so important and no one else is doing. And that's where you start like building your own framework or, you know, uh, or writing your own book. And I think just being way more invested in something than anyone else is reasonably with, with you know, with a reasonably sane mind would do. But that makes you the expert in the, in the topic. And then and no longer are you going out to other people. People come to you for your expertise. Um, and that's that's really nice. So it's like exploring is like is like exploring wide to to broaden your horizons. Mile wide, inch deep. Um, and and the, the the problem that you're trying to solve is that you don't know what you don't know. The learning exhaust is that you're <laughs> Thomas is like doing the finger guns. Uh, yeah. The learning exhaust that you're making is that you're just making notes to self because it really has no rhyme or reason. It just has to make sense to you. Uh, it doesn't doesn't have to have an overall theme. The output that you that you write is no, it's just episodic, and the commitment is very low, like the stuff that you can do in a day. Um, Sounds like Gary V kind of recommendation almost. You know, if if it's appropriate for the for the mode that you're in, which is exploring, right? And then connecting is more of the fact that you know things that others don't, and you're connecting them with that with that knowledge or connecting different topics with other topics. So the the, the stuff that you make starts being more publicly consumable. It's meant for others to 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 consume. It's no longer just for yourself. 
and you start to have certain pet topics, but you don't need to have an all overall grand theme, but you want to explore intersections. So, so for example, for me, I'm a connector right now. I, I connect React and TypeScript and I, I create content based on that. Um, I have an egghead list as well as, as the, the TypeScript cheat sheet that we'll, that we'll talk about later. And the commitment's kind of moderate. Uh, you're kind of putting yourself out there, but then you don't necessarily want to commit forever. And this category has like conference talks where you commit for a few months and after the talk, you're done, right? Like you're not, you're not stuck with it for life. And here you're just like doing three more than is trivial, but then actually making stuff that is meant for consumption for, by other people. And that, that actually builds capital, which is really nice. And then the last piece is, is, is mining, which is when, the, when something's, it, something important is too hard or too unknown and then, and then you start to build R&D and infrastructure and it's built to last. And there's all, probably one unifying theme to your work and the commitment is high on the, on the order of years and careers. And, and that's why you have to be really cautious about when you actually start doing this. It's like a, a kind of a, a deep exploration where you yeah. kind of know where you're going, but you're exploring kind of vertically, either building towers into the sky or digging deep into the earth. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, nice. <laughs> so that's, that's my that's my rough dichotomy uh, or like trichotomy of how people can learn in public, and um, I've yet to have anyone, you know, criticize it. I, I, I love. I actually love more like, hey, like this doesn't suit um, how this works, but it's just a mental model if it helps. Do you think that nice. there's a point where you like if if you if you're doing the connecting for a while and then you start doing some mining and you realize like ah, actually I don't I don't know if I want to do this forever. Yeah, switch gears. Yeah. That's why I try to make it casual. Like it's, it's bicycle gears. Are you going on steep terrain? All right, mine. Uh, are you on flat land? And just, you know, go for, go for the explorer. Yeah. So let's go to, to, to a concrete example that you just talked about, like the TypeScript and React thing. Yeah. Why, why did you start doing it? Why did you start creating the cheat sheet? So I started my job and, and uh, my team lead already decided that everything we did was going to be in TypeScript. Uh, I didn't know TypeScript. And then I went on the TypeScript docs and the TypeScript docs were an impenetrable mess of generic. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I went on the React docs and the Reacts, on the React docs, the TypeScript page is like, Here how, here's how you NPM install TypeScript. <laughs> Thanks, React. I know you want, to, you want to support Flow, but you're not really helping out here. So, this, so then I started like, uh, putting stuff up in a, in, a, in a readme. It was literally just one readme. Uh, I think if you go back to commits, um, you can see how little I knew. And then I just like started building it out and copying, basically copy pasting stuff from from my code base, which I I guess is like borderline illegal. I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's whatever. I, I I copy pasted that stuff from open source stuff before, so I don't know what's the what's the chain of causality uh, ownership there. I think the 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 benefit is like I had a need, other people had a need. People start people saw that I was doing this, and then they come join you because that's how you know community works and and and, and open source works. It's not code but it's kind of documentation that is missing. It's like kind of like the missing manual for React and TypeScript. And it just so happened that uh, TypeScript was gaining traction in JavaScript land. And then, I mean, this was like a year before everyone started, decided to move to TypeScript, right? It just happened that people, uh, TypeScript was gaining traction. And uh, I think, I think there was, there was, there's an increased need because there's more and more of us who may, maybe don't have a strong type background. I, I happen to, to have a Haskell background, but like, I don't remember much of it. And uh, it doesn't like, you know, that's a soundly type language and TypeScript is not. So there's, there's a lot of nuance here and, and the generic system is, 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 is pretty hard to navigate. So anyway, long story short, I started putting it together to TypeScript and then people started helping, helping out. And at this point, we, have, we now have a 20-page basic cheat sheet. We have advanced tips uh, for advanced people who want to make use of perfect uh, for uh, maximum type safety. We have migrating to help people migrate. Uh, we have higher order component cheat sheet for people because it, that's, the, that's the hardest part about typing. Things yes. Like we have a Chinese translation. Uh, and then we have a bunch of other uh, cheat, sheets, cheat sheets that I'm trying to grow. So now, now I started to branch out into non-React. So like, what about Node? What about GraphQL? What about you know, Vue? Um, Ang- like Angular's paper. I, I need hard copy. <laughs> well, I actually printed it out for Reactathon uh, this year, and uh, people people really liked it. <laughs> they were they were sort of riffing through it and asking me questions and stuff. I, yeah, yeah, it maybe is a mini mini book. I actually belatedly discovered that I'm not the first to do this. There was one former member of the TypeScript team, Basarat. He did the React Redux TypeScript cheat sheet. I didn't know about that, but then also when I looked at it, it was it had a lot of Redux stuff, and I didn't necessarily want to get weighed down by the by just the Redux type typings, which which was a lot. And so I just wanted to focus people and and and, and just have a nice on ramp. 
um, and just write it for people like me. So at this point, like, I, you know, I've, I know that I've taught and been taught TypeScript. Like, I've been taught TypeScript by the TypeScript core team, right? Because they, they go through this, this, uh, uh, this cheat sheet as well. And, and, I, and, I've, and I've taught people at like, I don't know, like Uber, Palantir, Atlassian, like just like people who, who access, who want uh, this kind of accessible TypeScript knowledge. Uh, they'll, they'll find this eventually because it, it's, it's got a pretty strong word of mouth. And I think that's a really ex- good example of what learning in public can do for you because I get taught by every single PR and issue that comes in and I pay nothing for that tuition, but I, I, I get a lot out of it. And it's, it's capital because I, you know, it, it's still usable to other people even while I sleep, which again, like going back to the whole reason I got into tech is, uh, got into web dev is like, I wanted to not be the blocker, right? I, I didn't want to have to push the button. I didn't, I didn't want to have to be the guy standing in front of the class, like personally speaking the words, like, Technology works for you when when you use it to, to its full potential. I think I think content is 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 very uh, amenable to that. <laughs> Sorry, have I have I <laughs> have I exhausted all questions? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's amazing. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so yeah, one I mean, thing that you mentioned in your learn in public public thing is, um, you know. Oh, you think you're done? Don't stop there. You know, if you enjoyed this, reach out to the instructors and thank them. Yeah. We were kind of living in a in a unique period in time where you can literally just reach out to people. Like I I don't remember when. Like I randomly emailed Tim Berners Lee and he repl- replied to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like oh, I didn't know you were real. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we we live in a special time and a special industry where it's super young. Everyone who basically created it is still alive. We should take advantage of that as much as possible. And it's also a fact that most people don't reach out, right? Like I don't get that many uh, messages on my stuff. Uh, and, and I think uh, if, especially if you're a book author, you'll, you'll also notice that you just don't get that much response. Like either way, it's kind of depressing. Like it's kind of like you're shuffling off into a void, but like it's, it's, it's just simple, symptomatic of like what they call the dark matter developers. Like they're, they're out there. They don't, they don't engage much online. They just, you know, and it's perfectly fine. They, the code to, to, to do their job and that's about it. But you can exploit that by just, you know, taking advantage of the communi- communication channels that are available to you, which are, you know, awesome. Like, you know, mostly Twitter and GitHub. I, I think Reddit, Reddit is never going to be a primary source just because of how anonymous it is and, and sort of doesn't have much structure apart from a comment system. But it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely a good place for discovery of stuff because people can vote. And I think that's, those are the main primary channels. And, yeah, I, I, like I always, I always like to say. I think in that essay, like Thomas, that you that you that you were talking about, like I always like to say, like you should pick up what they put down. A lot of uh, the people that we look up to, they always have too much to do. Um, they and they're always saying, like, oh, it would be really nice if so if uh, someone did this, like you know, good first issue, or like, hey, like if there's anyone want to try doing X, Y, Z. People don't. People have busy lives, or they're just too lazy. Um, and it's and if you want to pick up on it, then you get to work one on one with the people with the people that you know you like to be mentored. Like it's much better to to work on that and have them unofficially become your mentor by by action rather than like, hey, like can we can I buy you coffee and like can I pick your brain? That's such that's such a meager trade of value. It's much better to work with, engage with them on, on specific things that they want to, they want to work on, and you can get mentoring via that. Yeah. It's like drafting them to become their men- your mentor. Like they almost don't have a choice. <laughs> you don't have a choice because you're one of three people who maybe signed up, um, and you and you just got there first, or whatever. Yeah, the opportunities are out there. You just kind of like, like <laughs> go and go and seize them. Before, seize the day before someone else does, but probably nobody else will. So just go, go do it yourself and, and own it. You know, I think yeah, we could do a whole episode on on like mentorship and and trying to find a mentor, and that's a whole yeah, that's a whole. Yeah. And it's highly aligned with like validation and, you know, how do you know if anybody cares about the, the stuff that we're producing? And Right. To some extent, you shouldn't care. Um, you should work on whatever makes you happy and, and whatever that collides with what you're ultimately trying to work on, which is maybe a product or, or something at work or, or side project. But obviously, we're all social creatures and we, we do care about validation. We do care about uh, social proof. So, you know, I think, I think if you just listen to other people, listen, uh, listen to podcasts like this one, and figure out what people are interested in. I think a really, I, I was asked this actually, like, how do you, like, there's so many things that are, that are new. What do you know which to bet on? I think this is a legitimate question because there, there's, you know, it could be, it could be uh, any number of things. I tend to be, uh, so there's a, there's a adoption curve, like an S curve uh, with regards to 
like if, if you read uh, Crossing the Chasm, there's five stages of adoption. And I think a lot of people get burned by being super early adopters. Like they'll throw themselves in this, into this thing that's brand new and then it just dies and they, they'll just have wasted their time on it. So I think being late, slightly later, like middle in, in the adoption curve uh, really benefits you because by then you've already had a core base of people that, that have proven it out for you. Definitely, definitely don't stop being an early adopter because we need them. Otherwise, <laughs> things will never, never, never progress. But just be, just be careful about where you, where you, where you put your chips. And then the other thing about the other thing is also watch where companies are investing. So like when, when you hear things like Airbnb has moved their entire code base over to TypeScript, that's a much stronger signal than any individual influencer because that's entire teams of devs, entire teams, entire infrastructure at companies, and millions and millions of dollars uh, spent doing this. So, so uh, watch the company signals. So one last thing, like there, there, kind of a major point that like Gary Vee has been made recently is like the the seventy nine twenty one principle of you need your main thing that you're focused on that's like your bread and butter, but you also need to to make sure that you you have your fingers in other pies that you that you're not all eggs in one basket. So it, to me, it's like the the explorer versus mining kind of dynamic. You, you need to do both. Like if you're t- doing all mining and no exploring, you're going to miss the boat and you're going to be somebody that's trying to do action script in 2019. <laughs> I nearly missed that because I was so into it, but I was like, I, I could read the, you know, meanie, meanie, Tickle and Parson and like, oh, you got to get out of here. Yeah. And yeah, but like the same thing is happening now. It feels like there are some technologies that are about to vanish that we don't realize. And if we're not keeping our eyes open, if you're like one of those guys that's like still super anti TypeScript now, I'm like, well, <laughs> I mean, so like, uh, again, like it, it, the, the world's a big place. Like as long as you're happy doing the thing that you need to with the, with the, with the tech stack that, that you, that you choose and you're comfortable with perfectly fine. You don't have to be on, on top of every, every single Yeah, life. You don't have to be doing the latest thing, right? It's just always yeah. going to be jobs out there. Yeah. I mean, there's there's still jobs programming COBOL, right? That's it's always yeah, exactly. Thing too. It's just like you know, I, I think to the extent, especially if your career kind of depends on 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 being uh, sort of on the cutting edge, like like I do, then you do have to be a little bit more sensitive to to what people uh, are the winds of change, as as they say. But I guess it's about being intentional with your choice, and instead of accidentally, oh yeah, you know, painting yourself into a corner because you forgot to explore. Also, uh, like having principles to what you what you what you want. Like you care about functional, what is it? Functional core imperative boundaries, or maybe the other way around. Like you care about you know, there's certain uh, principles of coding that you that you attune to, and certain technologies will suit that. Like type safety, um, static t- static typing that will help to guide you towards uh, certain choices. Great. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give you full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So... If you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. Maybe we should end on that and move to picks. How about Thomas, you go first. My favorite book right now is Atomic Habits by James Clear. Just kind of getting into like the psychology of like, what are we doing and how to kind of hack your own psychology using kind of simple things. You don't have to worry about like, well, I'll do it once I'm motivated. Like, forget that. That's just not how humans work. It's like hack your own motivation, hack your own. Anyway, it's very exciting. And it kind of has a lot of correlations with what Swix has been talking about. I need to think I need to listen to this episode again and think about that somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a great book. Yeah, I think you, you 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 already had it as a picks once, right, Dave? I think I've had that pick maybe twice. So <laughs> we've got a lot of representation for that book. It's it's a good one. That's um, can, can can I do my picks now because it's kind of related and sure. it's really funny that you chose this <laughs> because my pick for today is is a tweet from James Clear. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> That's it? funny. I was thinking of it. Uh, like he on Twitter, he asked, what is one article you've read that is so good it's worth reading again? And it became like a bunch of, it has like a bunch of answers and it's like a gold mine of good posts on the internet. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. It's like so, a like a meta pick of picks, I guess, huh? That, it's, <laughs> <laughs> I just scaled my picks. <laughs> <laughs> that's not fair. No leveraging so, picks. <laughs> I think you commented on that thread too, right, Swix? Yeah, I gave. Uh, I, t- I actually picked out the Twelve Leverage Points essay by Donella Meadows. Which is really um, it's, good. It's the kind of like the the introductory piece to systems thinking, yeah. And basically, it, it, it's applicable to any sort of complex system, which which I highly recommend. Yeah, I have so much homework now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, most awesome. convers- uh, you can you can ask Leslie. Like most conversations with me involve homework. <laughs> my favorite thing i have just like a running notion list of all the links that swix mentions in our in our one-on-ones <laughs> that's great so leslie how about you do you have any picks yeah something not meta at all and kind of totally unrelated but um storybook which is the component kind of explore component library that exists um has a new add-on for accessibility which i think is really cool they basically have built in the Axe accessibility engine uh, into Storybook. So if you're already using Storybook, uh, you can get like warnings, violations, all that stuff right within Storybook instead of having to like go and test in Lighthouse or go and test somewhere else. And it's all the same tools. They've just baked it right into Storybook. So it's nice. uh, pretty sweet. And I really want to start using it. That's huge because that's a huge uh, workflow boost. If you can just get that automated as you're going, that's huge. Yeah, the biggest thing is just not to forget about it, right? And if it's right there staring you in the face, you're, you're going to take care of those warnings. That's one thing James Clear talks about is like, make it obvious, make it easy, etc. Nice. Good tie-in. Sebastian uh, Mark Boga also has this idea about uh, tools that help you hold the line. They're like ratchets that they, they, they don't let like you backslide. And so like coveralls, for example, which are for, for test coverage, that's very powerful as like an incremental improvement mechanism. Awesome. Sean, do you have any picks for this week? Yeah, a couple. Uh, one's very quick, which is Lizzo's Juice. I just heard about this. I just heard this song yes. on, on, on NPR Tiny Desk. It, it, it bops. Oh my God, it's so good. It's the song of the summer. It's, it's so amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm like dancing while I, while, I, while I work, which is very embarrassing for... We need to see the TikToks. Let's go. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, totally. And then uh, one is uh, Dark Night Diaries is, is one of the, the podcasts I've been really enjoying recently. It was recommended by Scott Talensky on the Syntax FM podcast. Uh, he has this obsession with true crime, I think because he's planning one. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, But basically, Dark Night Diaries is all about hacking. Like the stuff that we do is so mundane compared to what all these guys are. And, and the most recent episode, they talk about, he talks about his, his story hacking his way into DEF CON and like winning some sort of black card or something that, that gets him free for all invites to, to the future. But like the, the story is super exciting and it's like very technical, but then also very intense and exciting and time bound and very approachable. I, I highly recommend it. Awesome. Okay. So I've, I've got a couple picks. One is a video by Tyler McGinnis called Why React Hooks. He just released, released it the other day. And it's, uh, it's, it's a good overview of like, in, instead of just jumping on the hook bandwagon because it's cool and because it's new. Like he, he kind of goes through the history of, of React before hooks and like why hooks are cool and why they're, why they're useful. So I think that's a, good, that's a good watch. And another one that I thought was fun and kind of unrelated to front-end stuff at all, but it's, um, it's the story of um, Prusa, the 3D printer company, and kind of how they started in their basement with like two 3D printers and grew into this massive factory with hundreds of them and has like 100,000 printers across the world now. It's cool. It's a cool story of like a bootstrap company that started tiny and, and grew as, they, as their demand grew and stuff. It's, it's fun. So I think that wraps it up. This has been an awesome conversation. Thanks, Sean, for joining us today. Oh, no. Thank you for having me. This is a blast. Absolutely. <laughs> so thanks, everyone, for listening. And so we'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more. <laughs>